Welcome to episode 49 of the 24-Hour Hustle Show, and today we got special guest, candidate running for Allegheny County District Attorney, Teron Jenkins. Welcome to the 24-Hour Hustle Show. I'm your host, Anthony Freeze, and this is the show where we get the chance to sit down with amazing guests and get a chance to hear about their stories, their struggles, and also their success. If this is the very first time you're finding out about us, definitely make sure you subscribe to the channel. Make sure you hit the bell so that you can get notifications every time I post. But today we got special guest Teron Jenkins. Uh, I've definitely heard a lot about uh, yourself and the things that you're doing. You're definitely doing a lot of great work in the city of Pittsburgh. And also being able to run uh, as far as Allegheny District Attorney is definitely uh, something that we need for sure. Um, And uh, just to be able to get into this conversation with you and uh, learn about some of the things about yourself as far as like your upbringing, why you're running, and, you know, some of the plans that you have for the future. I'm definitely looking forward to this conversation. So I definitely uh i'm glad to have you on the show so welcome to the show thanks for having me yeah absolutely so um for people who may not know who you are yet you know um you know kind of give us a little bit of your background a little bit of your story your name and you know kind of where you're coming from and where you're going certainly i um i'm from moroville pennsylvania i grew up in moroville i'm the youngest of four i have three older sisters so you can imagine what that was like growing up (laughs) yeah so um Went to Gateway High School, and um, I tell this story all the time. Uh, you'll probably appreciate it. But my last year of high school, my mother asked me what I wanted to do with my life. And at the time, I'm working at Bob Evans as a dish as a dishwasher, a busboy, and a cook. Mm-hmm. And I'm making like $100 a week. And to a 16-year-old kid, that's all the money in the world. So yeah, I said, you know what, Mom? I'm content. I said, college could wait. I said, I'm making $100 a week. I don't have any bills. I don't have any responsibilities. I said, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So she said, oh, no, (laughs) you're going to college. Mm -hmm. I'm like, here we go. So um, my sisters had gone to college, but I kind of wanted to find my own way, find Mm -hmm. my own path. So I um, I wasn't too keen on the idea. Plus, I didn't think I was college material. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't... uh, I didn't have that much confidence in my ability to go to college. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't have the most encouraging teachers through uh, through the course of my education. So I did have uh, one high school teacher that was a mentor. Uh, He always poured love into me. I keep in touch with him to this day. And when I told him that I was thinking about college, he encouraged it. He he actually helped me fill out my college entrance um, applications. So I applied essentially to get my mom off my back. Um, I said, you know what, if she wants me to go to college, I'll, I'll go through the motions, I'll just get her to be quiet. So mm-hmm. I ended up applying to IUP, Cal, and a couple other schools. Like I said, I really didn't have a game plan. I just figured this is something that, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll see what happens because, like I said, I didn't think I was college material. So I ended up going to IUP. I was undecided. I bounced around for a couple of years. My grades were okay. I was a, a business major, accounting major, undecided major, political science major, and then I landed on criminology. Mm-hmm. And uh, I really enjoyed the study of the criminal justice system. So once I started studying criminal justice, uh, criminology, my GPA just soared because I found something that I was passionate a bit, passionate about, and something that I felt like I could make a career working in. So I um. My senior year of college, a friend of mine comes to me and says, you know what, you have good grades, you, sh- you should think about law school. So I laughed again, like, here we go. Mm. No way. I said, um, I said that's, I appreciate the compliment, but that's probably not for me. Um, I don't know anybody that's gone to law school. I don't know any lawyers. I don't really think that that's my path. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, he kept encouraging me to apply. So once again, I applied just to get them on my back. Um, because uh, I just didn't think opportunities like that would be available to me. So I initially applied, and I didn't get in, so I come home, and I end up doing social work. I did social work for about two years, actually longer than that, because I continued to do it while I was in law school. Mm-hmm. So I worked, I did like I did in ba- in-home, community-based, and school-based um, social work. 
I enjoyed it. I um, my concentration was adolescence. I worked from kids anywhere from seven all the way up to seventeen. Um, after a while, I felt like it was time to go back to school, so I ended up applying. Ended up getting into the Duquesne Law School. Mm-hmm. I show up first day again. It's like it's an away game. It's like I. Um, there weren't too many people to look like me in the class. I think there was one other black man and two or three black women. And um, I'm kind of lost. It's like uh, this is a new experience. Um, a lot of the, um, a lot of my class, well, maybe not a lot, but a sizable portion of my classmates, they had the benefit of having uncles and fathers and, and brothers and sisters that were lawyers, so they kind of had an advantage. Meanwhile, I don't know anybody that's a lawyer, so I'm kind of, starting behind the eight ball. So law school was difficult for me because it was a new way of thinking. I really didn't have the resources. So um, I still really don't know what I what I wanted to do. So I ended up getting a um, an externship in federal court right downtown Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. And I just watched trial after trial after trial after trial. And it really piqued my interest. I felt like trial work was something that I could do and be good at. So my last year of law school, I took a trial adv- advocacy class, and I learned how to um, try cases, essentially. Mm-hmm. And I really, really enjoyed it. I, I felt like um, it's something that I could do, and it was something that I could do well. Mm-hmm. That was one of my best grades in law school, trial mm-hmm. advocacy. So I graduate, still don't really know what I want to do, and uh, I had the f- good fortune of working in the public defender's office as a law clerk. Um, at the time, I wasn't licensed. I wasn't actually able to practice. But I was able to work with the attorneys, learn the system, file motions, do research, research, things of that nature. And it gave me my first um, first glance at the criminal justice system here in Allegheny County. I was able to um, work with some really good people, make some really good connections, and just uh, develop a better understanding of how the system works. So after I became licensed, I applied to the public defender's office. But for whatever reason, I wasn't able, I wasn't, I wasn't, I didn't get an interview. So Mm -hmm. I ended up going to the district attorney's office, which is a place I never thought that I would end up working. So I get to the district attorney's office, and um, it's a new experience. It's like now I'm on the other side. Mm -hmm. Um, The benefit of working in the district attorney's office, it's it's, uh, what people say, it's the power position. Because as as a district attorney, you wield a lot of power. Mm-hmm. You um, and what I mean by that, a lot of the decisions um, come through the district attorney's office in terms of who's charged and how cases are resolved. Whereas as, as the public defender, you essentially have to, to to fight and claw your way for justice. Whereas the district attorney, you make the final call. Mm-hmm. So I'm in the district attorney's office. I um, not to toot my own horn. But I was a I was a pretty good trial attorney, and when young attorneys in that office get their first jury trial, they're typically handpicked. So typically, as a young attorney, you may get like a a DUI or a simple assault or retail theft, kind of low level charges. But my very first trial as a, an assistant district attorney was a, a criminal attempt homicide because mm-hmm. that was you know they had faith in me, they had faith in my skill set. It was a violent shooting down in the uh, strip district where a um, it was a bar fight and it ended up an innocent bystander ended up getting shot, and um, I tried it and uh, he was convicted and it kind of boost my confidence because I it made me realize that I could excel at being a trial attorney. And another thing about working in the, in the district attorney's office, when people would often ask me what I did. I would tell them that I was a minister of justice because that's how I felt because mm-hmm. I knew how important that position was. You had the power and authority to affect the trajectory of anybody that came across, you know, the file that came across. So I was always mindful of that. And it's people always think, oh, prosecutors, all they do is lock people up. While there's some truth to that, but at the same time, you can cut people breaks that deserve them. And there are a lot of people that deserve breaks. There are a lot of people that make a mistake and that mistake shouldn't define the rest of their life. Mm. And I think that you need to have a degree of mercy when dealing with people because you need to look at people as people as opposed to just a docket. Mm-hmm. And justice sometimes quiet requires people to uh, to have breaks in order to get their lives back in, back, back in place because 
The system is very unforgiving. Mm -hmm. I tell people all the time, convictions, whether they're low-grade misdemeanors or a felony, they're scarlet letters for the rest of your life. You have to go on explaining to, to, to potential employers, schools, what have you, um, the nature of, of your charges. And, you know, it, 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 it essentially closes doors. Mm -hmm. So I was a, um, I, I stayed in that office for about three years. I tried a lot of cases. I, uh, I was always fair. I was always advocating for justice, mm -hmm. uh, whether I was, whether it's for a victim, and sometimes you have to um, be mindful of uh, defendants and their rights as well. So I did that for about three, almost three years, and I went into private practice. Mm -hmm. uh, my mentor at the time, he, uh, he had his own private practice, and I joined him. And 90% of what I did was uh, criminal defense work. I did that uh, for about four and a half years. I practiced here in Allegheny County surrounding areas. I, uh, I developed a reputation for always being fair, being a zealous advocate when I had to be, and always being above board, because I always believed in justice, mm -hmm. fighting for justice, fighting for my clients, because it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. It's what the Constitution mandates, justice for all. Mm -hmm. So after about four and a half years, the uh, my mentor, like I said at the time, he became appointed to be the director of the Public Defender's Office. And he um, asked me to come over to be one of his deputies. Initially, I was didn't think that that would be a good move. But the more and more I thought about it, the more I felt like it would be an opportunity for me to use my skills to enhance the quality of the representation for people who can't afford attorneys, mm -hmm. public defenders. Mm -hmm. So I ended up going to um, the public defender's office as the uh, deputy of pretrial division. Uh, the the pretrial deputy is uh, responsible for training the newest hires to come into the office because they essentially do what we call preliminary hearings, which is, we can talk about that later, which is your first hearing after mm -hmm. you're arrested. So a lot of these uh, newer attorneys are new to the practice of law, and they don't have that much criminal law experience for obvious reasons because they're, they're young attorneys, younger, new to, new to the practice. So it was my job to get them court, courtroom ready. It was my job to uh, teach them about the system. And it was essentially my job to, to train them. So I did that for about three and a half years. I'm pretty proud of the work I did while I was in that office in that role. Uh, one of the first things that I did when I took that position uh, was to look at all the people that were incarcerated in the Allegheny County Jail. Mm -hmm. Because there are a lot of people in the jail that don't need to be in the jail. A lot of uh, low-level nonviolent offenders that are in jail by virtue of not being able to afford bonds. So like a thousand dollars at 10%, which will require someone to pay a hundred dollars, mm. might as well be all the money in the world if you don't have any money or anybody else had to pay it. Right. So the first thing that I did, I looked at everybody that was incarcerated that was eligible for a bond reduction for low-level offenses and had the attorneys file bond motions to get them out because it it violates the core sense of fundamental fairness for people to sit in jail who are supposed to be innocent until proven guilty, but they're sitting in jail for, they can sit in jail for almost a year waiting for their cases to be resolved. Meanwhile, I felt it was important to get them out of the jail, get them back to the community, get them back to their families, get back to, back to their jobs, uh, because it does more damage the longer you sit in, in, in the Allegheny County Jail because it's, you're essentially cut off, your family's cut off, there are just so many collateral consequences. And for people that don't make a lot of money, one day in jail could disrupt their life. If you don't make a whole lot of money and you miss one or two day days in jail, the odds of you being able to maintain employment go down mm -hmm. because it's you need to get to work. Mm -hmm. So that was one of, the, one of the first things I did when I came to the office because I felt that uh, it needed to be done. I, I'm, the, I'm of the, the mindset if... If you can do something that, to help somebody, to help get them through the system, you have to do it because it's public defenders. If you don't do it, nobody else will. Mm -hmm. So that was always my mindset. So I did that for about uh, about two and a half years, and I ended up being promoted to the uh, chief deputy director, which is like number two in the office. Mm -hmm. And I've always been an advocate, advocate for change within the system. Uh, one example was uh, probably back this past April, a group of us went to uh, to the Bronx up in New York. Mm -hmm. They are like, uh, the Bronx Public Defender's Office is arguably one of the best public defender's offices in the country. 
And the reason why I say that, they view cases through what we call a holistic approach and what they do. They don't just look at the criminal case. They look at all the other issues that surround a person coming through the system, whether it's housing, whether it's employment, whether it's immigration status, what have you. So they would do everything that they could for that person individu individually as they go through the system to put them in the best chance of putting their life back together once they came out on the other side. Mm. So we went to the public defender's office in, uh, in April, and because we just can't replicate what they do in New York, in the Bronx, we were able to advocate for, the, for social workers to be added to our, to our staff, which is a game changer because now we have somebody that can coordinate resources for the people that we represent mm -hmm. uh, and, and hopefully get them back on track so when they process through the system, they'll be in much, much better shape than they were coming in. Mm -hmm. So that was the goal. There were a lot of a lot of little things that we did within the system to try to make it better for mm -hmm. our clients, um, but as time had gone on, um, there's only so much you can do as a public defender. Mm -hmm. um, the real power position, again, comes from the district attorney's office. And I was able to uh, take part in a lot of what we call high-level meetings with various stakeholders within the system, whether it was adult probation, court administrators, Department of Human Services, um, what have you. And we were all trying to find ways to make the system more just, mm -hmm. more efficient, and the one party that was consistently absent and not really engaged in that process was the personnel from the, from the district attorney's office. Mm -hmm. So we would try to find ways to work around them, but it got to the point where you, they have to get on board or mm -hmm. the system can't, it can't, it can't evolve to the needs of, uh, of the people. And anytime you have a system dealing with people, you have to adjust. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the way we did education, even when, when I grew up, now when I grew up, I look at how they do things now with my children. It, it's different because yeah. you change. You oh, evolve yeah. over time. Mm -hmm. And this system here, it hasn't evolved and it hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. So um, that is the reason why I'm running. Mm -hmm. I feel that I have uh, obviously the experience I have the um, the innovation, and I, I have the desire to effectuate some of these changes that are so desperately needed. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so, like, for people who may not understand or are not as educated, what are some of the things that do go down that a lot of people maybe not understand? Or what are some of the changes or challenges that are faced in this system that, that you're looking to impact? Certainly. Um, right now, there is a, a routine practice by the district attorney's office and law enforcement to overcharge people. And what I mean by that, um, I'll give you an example. You may, have, you may have a fight between two individuals, which would be a simple assault, but they charge somebody with aggravated assault because it gives them leverage later on to negotiate plea. So a lot of the times people are forced to plead to, to, to uh, charges that, they didn't necessarily, that they're not necessarily guilty of because they don't want to run the risk of going to trial and losing. So you have people actually pleading guilty to things that they didn't do mm. out of fear because it's, it's when you overcharge people, you have leverage over them. And if you're in jail, which a lot of people are, you'll plead to whatever is offered in order to get out, mm -hmm. and that's that's not fair. That's not justice. Mm -hmm. It's not justice. And you, I also think we need to take a look at our cash bail system. Um, we have people that are similarly situated that are charged with a crime, but one person has money, the other person doesn't. Mm -hmm. So this person has the ability to, to pay the bond and get out while the other person stays in jail. Mm -hmm. It's just essentially a war on poverty. Mm -hmm. And then I think we need to... Uh, look at our use of diversionary courts and what I mean by that. Everybody that comes through the system doesn't necessarily need to come through the system. You have a lot of people suffering from mental health deficiencies mm. with the closing of all these state hospitals. The people that were getting help from the state hospitals are now coming through the system and are being prosecuted, mm. which is not fair. You have people that suffer from uh, drug and alcohol issues. We're in the midst of an opioid epidemic, which I'm sure you're well aware of. Mm -hmm. It's affecting everybody across the county. 
There needs to be more use of diversion. What I mean by that, we need to focus on treatment, and we're not doing that. I think people come through the system, and rather than getting help, we're essentially punishing them. Um, if you look at uh, the crack cocaine epidemic that ravaged the country, Allegheny County was no different. Back in the 80s and 90s, you've had people that had addictions. They were subject to mandatory minimum sentences, um, and it essentially... They ruin lives when it didn't have to. I think now I think that lawmakers are, are seeing this as a public health issue, which they should, and there's a little more compassion now than there was before. Mm -hmm. uh, but back then, people were being shuffled through the system. Um, they weren't given any tools while they were incarcerated, no job training, no education. So they come home. They don't have the tools they need to succeed. They, they're cut off from employment, they're cut off from housing, they're cut off from benefits, so they end up coming right back through the system. It ends up being a revolving door, mm -hmm. needlessly, needlessly. So we, we spend so much time on punishment, and we don't focus enough on rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. And we're doing the same thing now. Where it's all, the, the sole focus is, is on punishment and convictions and, and putting people in jail. When we have too much talent here, too many bright minds here, we have to be more innovative in how we treat people because right now we're not treating people right and people are suffering. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, I totally agree with that um, for sure because, you know, especially with mental health, uh, Absolutely. It's, it's something in the black community that is definitely br starting to get a lot more awareness. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, sometimes, you know, it, it seems like, Maybe even like a few years ago, it seemed like it was something that was maybe taboo that Absolutely. someone that was black couldn't have a mental health issue. Um, and we know right now that's not the case. Um, and uh, being able to get treatment for that person and maybe and be able to get the resources and the tools to be able to put themselves together is essentially what they need in Absolutely. order to be able to get back into the world. Um, so as far as like you being able to run, because that's something that you, you want to do right now uh, and something that you're working on, uh, what are what are some of the maybe the initial challenges or struggles that you're facing with that? And how are you looking to overcome them? And why? Did, and and what was the big inspiration of one to, you know, push for this for yourself? Absolutely. I think uh, probably my greatest hurdle is uh, people don't know who I am. Mm -hmm. I, uh, people within the legal community know because I've been working in this field since 2004. Mm. After, uh, yeah, that's uh, a long time. It's a long time. So I, I've made uh, connections within the legal community, more in particular the, the criminal defense bar. Um, but anybody outside of that, they don't know who I am. Mm -hmm. So I think my greatest hurdle is getting my message out to the people all mm -hmm. over Allegheny County. Yeah. I, uh, Hopefully we can improve on absolutely. that too. Absolutely. Look, I've been a prosecutor. I've, I've run my own law practice. I was a law professor while I was in the public defender's office. I managed an office of 127 employees. I, uh, I supervised other attorneys. Um, I have I have the skills. I have the, the education, and I have the will to do it. Mm -hmm. And there was no real singular moment where I said, you know what, I want to run, run for district attorney's office. It was just a series of events because, um, like I said, being the chief deputy director of the public defender's office, you essentially have a front row seat to the system and its inner workings. And the longer I, 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 I stayed in that role, the more frustrated I became because I knew real change could not occur by me working as a public defender. The change has to come from the district attorney's office. Mm -hmm. And again, it hasn't been willing to make adjustments. And I feel like if I have the tools and the resources in the background and all the gifts and talents um, to make a change, and I do nothing, I sit back and I watch, mm -hmm. I'm part of the problem. And I have a wife and two small children at home, and how could I tell them to always stand up and do the right thing and fight for what's right if I'm not doing it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I've seen you out there being the example and doing what's right, even uh, with the situation with Antoine Rose um, in that situation Absolutely. being out there and uh, fighting for what was right. And, uh, you know, what, what was even that situation like putting yourself out there, speaking out for what was right, and just, you know, being that example for people to see? Absolutely. Yeah, like with um, Antoine Rose, that 
situation was heartbreaking. Yeah. Because we see situations like that happen all the time, all over the country. And um, to actually, for it to actually happen here mm. and to have the, um, the video evidence to substantiate what actually happened, it, uh, it's just a reminder. It's a reminder to me as a father um, that the, the current uh, environment now is not healthy for anybody. Because right now there's such a divide between our community and law enforcement. Um, I don't have a magic wand to be able to fix it, um, but I think we need to really look, all of us collectively, I think we need to look at ourselves because we need to figure out a way to come together and work together. Mm -hmm. How we accomplish that, the only way we accomplish that is by sitting down, talking to each other and trying to figure things out because I, I don't think there's any dispute um, that there are, there are good and bad people in all professions. There are good and bad lawyers, good and bad bus drivers, good and bad police officers. But I think the thing that really frustrates people is that there are some really good police officers, but there are also bad police officers, and the good police officers don't speak up mm. when they see wrong. Mm. And that, I, my humble opinion, I think that continues to perpetuate the, um, the divide between our community and law enforcement. Mm. And that's something that needs to be addressed mm. now mm -hmm. um, because I think the longer things like this marinate, the more explosive things can become in the future. Um, so when I think about Antoine Rose and that whole situation, I don't want to talk too much about it mm -hmm. um, for, uh, for obvious reasons. Um, I just think about my children and what kind of world do I want them to live in? Mm -hmm. Because right now, the way things are, it's not safe for anybody. Mm. Absolutely, absolutely. And, uh, what, and um, what do you feel as far as, like, maybe the vetting process as far as police officers go, as far as being able to filter in and out people, as far as being able to find the the good people? What, what do you feel about absolutely. that? Absolutely. I think that um, I'm obviously not a police officer, so right. I, don't, I don't know what their um, – their procedures are, but I think bec by just by by the virtue of what a police officer does and what they're tasked with, you have to be careful about who you're bringing in. You're giving that person the authority, arrest power, as well as a weapon to go out to the community. So if you don't have a good idea of who these people are, what their backgrounds are, what their psychological backgrounds are, it could be a potential an obvious potential for danger. Mm. Mm, absolutely. And then uh, also, you know, with you being able to run for, you know, DA will definitely be a, a huge change, huge impact, uh, a great influence that I think will be able to happen on the on the community. Um, as you are running, uh, you know, and, and this is something um, based off our conversation before, you said um, this hasn't changed in over 20 years. You know, so it's uh, definitely long overdue. So what are, um, you know, as far as let's say you do get in, what are some of the changes and impact that you're looking to make immediately and even going into the future? One thing that's, that has always frustrated me, there are, there are a few things I'd like to talk about. Mm -hmm. One thing that, that still, frustra still frustrates me to this day is if you're tra charged with a crime and you're found not guilty or the charges are withdrawn, you still have a criminal record. Mm. And the only way you get that expunged is if you pay for it, and it's expensive. It could be upwards of three hundred dollars. Mm. So, I think I don't think that that's right. I think that if you're found not guilty, or the charges are withdrawn, your record should automatically be expunged. Because once again, if you don't expunge it, which a lot of people don't have the resources to do, mm -hmm. you're gonna have to explain that to an employer. You're gonna have to explain that to you're uh, to, to school, you're going to explain that to housing. There are so many collateral consequences associated, not only just with a criminal conviction, but just by virtue of being charged it's, that a lot of people aren't aware of. Mm -hmm. that, that that has to be looked at because it's not fair. It's, it's, it's crippling. Mm -hmm. It's crippling. The other thing that I spoke on it initially was the use of diversionary courts. We need to figure out ways to divert the people that are suffering from mental health deficiencies 
as well as the people that have severe addiction issues. We have to figure out ways to divert them from, from the system and get them the help that they need. Be because if we don't, if we don't do that, people are going to continue to die. People are going to continue to suffer. People are never going to be able to get their lives back in track. And it's, 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 it's going to affect generations to come. It's like uh, the faucet is on and we have to turn it off. Mm -hmm. We have to turn it off. And again, I think that, uh, obviously I'm not a police officer again, but I think we need to look at community policing because back in the day, citizens knew who the police were in their community. Not so much anymore. Right. Not so much anymore. And as an attorney um, who's been in a courthouse, who's, a, who's associated with law enforcement, both as a prosecutor and as a defense attorney, I could see how that disconnect and how, that, um, how those interactions are often strained. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that has to do with, it's all about how you talk to people. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the times I think that the interaction between law enforcement and citizens, it starts off on a bad foot. So the cycle, it just continues. It mm -hmm. just continues. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then um, as you are, you know, putting your message out there and you're running your campaign and you, and you want to get, you know, that message out there to people, what would you say is, as you're running this campaign, the biggest message that you want to get across the people as far as, you know, maybe you as a person, maybe some of the changes that you're looking to make and uh, some of the impact that you're looking to influence into the future. What would, if you were able to talk to the people, like, where would some of those messages be that you're looking to get across? Certainly. I've always been an advocate for doing the right thing and standing up for everybody, no matter who you are, where you're from, what you're into. Because to me, that's important. That, that is my moral compass. I always felt like it was important to always do the right thing for everybody. And I think that my key message is I'm for everybody. I don't care who you are, um, where you're from. I just advocate for everybody because justice is for everybody. It's not limited to a small group. Um, everybody should feel like that they're part of the process, part of the system. And I feel like now... I don't think that that's the case. I, it's, to me, it seems as though the way the system is now, a lot of citizens feel disenfranchised from the system. Um, a lot of them don't want to engage the system because they feel like the system doesn't do anything for them. And that, that's tragic because it's supposed to be here for all of us. Mm -hmm. And right now, a lot of people are cut out. So, again, my, my biggest message is to be that I'm for everybody. Mm -hmm. And it's, if you look at my body of work, I've always been an advocate advocate for everybody, um, whether it was working in the district attorney's office or representing somebody charged with a crime. Mm -hmm. It's I've always felt for every fought for everybody. Mm -hmm. I've always made changes with the, within the system to the benefit of everybody. I didn't single anybody out because I felt this important for everybody to be included in the process. Mm, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And as we get closer to wrapping up, where would be the best place to, you know, contact you? Or if somebody wants to reach out, maybe they want to help volunteer, help you along with the campaign, maybe um, help you, you know, get that message out even more. Where would be the best place to reach you? Sure. I have a website. It's at JenkinsForDA.com. Very simple. J-E-N-K-I-N-S. F O R D A, Jenkins for D A dot com. Mm -hmm. They can send me an email, they can go to my website, what have you. I'm 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 easy to find. They'll see me out here in the community. Mm -hmm. I um I try to Try to be everywhere. Try mm -hmm. to try to engage everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see you do meetups and things mm -hmm. like that. So Certainly. You, and have events so people have the opportunity to come even meet you face to face that's and right. things like that. That's right, because that's important. You, you need to know who your elected officials are. Mm -hmm. You need to know them. You need to engage them. You need to ask them questions. Um, they they should be um, available for the people um, because you are working for the people. The only person that elected officials answer to are the people, are the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. So it's important for them to know who these people are that they're putting in office. Absolutely. That's mm -hmm. definitely highly important. And I would highly encourage anybody to, that comes across and sees an event that you're going to be at that's a meetup, to, you know, definitely go out to the event if they have time to come out and meet you, get to know you a little bit better uh, so that you can interact with them for sure because that'll be highly important to know and understand. 
Um, and then um, last question I always ask is, uh, what's a, a 24-hour challenge that you would propose to the audience that they can actually take action on? Mm-hmm. Um, because this is, I feel like, a definitely a, a very important episode, potentially even a historic one. Um, what would be a, a 24-hour challenge that you would propose to the audience that they can actually take action on and should take action on? Okay. Register to vote. Mm -hmm. I encourage everybody who's not registered to vote to get registered, and I would encourage you to um, pay close attention to this election. It's a very important election. Familiarize yourself with the system. Familiarize yourself with the the candidates um, because we're at a fork in the road. We're at a fork in the road. I would encourage you guys, if you're 17 and you'll be 18 by May, I would encourage you to vote as well. Mm-hmm. And when uh, when is the day for voting? Um, the the actual primary is May fifteenth, two thousand and nineteen. It sounds like it's far away, mm-hmm. but it's right around the corner. Yeah, right. We're already in October. Yeah, this right. year is almost over. That's right. That's right. So I would encourage you to register to vote. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yep. And any lasting messages that you maybe want to get across, something that we may not have talked about, maybe something on your heart that you maybe want to share, or maybe a message that you want to share with the people, or anything right. at all? I, um, like I said, I'm just grateful to be here. I look forward to seeing everybody out on the campaign trail. I would encourage you, engage me, come talk to me. I want to hear what your issues are, because I'm, I'm all about the people. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Well, I definitely appreciate yeah, you appreciate for coming on time, to the show, for sure. For sure. For sure. Um, definitely looking forward to what's happening. Definitely get out there and register to vote. That is definitely a great challenge that everybody can do. Hopefully, everybody accepts that challenge, Absolutely. for sure. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I definitely appreciate your time, you being able to come on and share your you story. And uh, hopefully, we can get this message out some more. So, uh, that is awesome. So, now that we know what Teron does with his 24 hours, we want to know what you do with your 24 hours. Leave some comments down below on accepting that challenge if you guys got any questions at all leave them down below whether it's for myself or uh, for Tehran we definitely want to engage with you we definitely want to communicate with you as well so with that thank you for watching if you uh, subscribe to the channel definitely make sure you uh, subscribe share like it comment all those good things and we will see you on the next episode